Welcome to the series on fluid mechanics. In this video, we're going to be talking about some of the fundamental concepts behind fluid mechanics. And basically what we're going to do in this series is we're going to be looking at two very separate uh, sections or sections or modules of fluid mechanics. So the first one is going to be, of course, fluid statics because it is easier and it sets the foundation for what we will be analyzing later on when we deal with fluid dynamics. So just to start off, what is fluid mechanics? Well, fluid mechanics is the study of fluid motion, and this can essentially be broken down into a series of very, very small but very important concepts. The first one is conservation. So as you may know from all of physics, conservation laws are probably the most important concepts that you need to learn and you need to understand very well if you are to solve any problems within that area of study. So conservation breaks down into three separate things. When it comes to fluid mechanics, we have conservation of mass, we have conservation of energy, and finally we have conservation of momentum. <coughs> so I would say that by knowing this three conservation laws and knowing how they are applied to fluid motion, you would pretty much be right on track to solving pretty much any problem in fluid mechanics within reasonable boundaries. There's another concept that comes into play, which is the concept of continuity. Continuity. And continuity really just refers to something like, so let's say that you have something like a cylinder immersed in a fluid and then there's just water that is flowing around it. So what continuity tells you is that because normally this fluid would just move in straight lines across this particular uh, country volume, continuity tells you that the fluid has to be displaced by this certain amount because obviously there's this cylinder blocking its path so obviously because of conservation of mass we need to have that uh, that fluid going somewhere else so this is what continuity is about so any fluid in motion needs to be continuous that's a, that's a requirement for our system that is being analyzed now often with fluid mechanics we can analyze things as single particles and I use this term very loosely because it doesn't need to be necessarily single particles every single time. But what, we, what you will see me doing a lot in this course is doing things like this, using a little section or a little extract of that particular fluid that is moving. And then I'm just going to draw vectors and things like velocity vectors, force vectors, stress vectors, and by analyzing that very, very small piece of fluid that is often an infinitesimal volume of fluid, we can usually derive very important equations for the, for the motion of the fluid as a whole, because in, in general, what is a fluid? Because it's continuity. We can model a fluid as just a sum of infinitesimal volumes, and that's a really, really powerful concept that we will be using to analyze problems. And finally, we need to point out the fact that in fluid mechanics, we need to use numerical methods most of the time for real analysis that relate to this science that we would use in proper engineering. So numerical methods such as computational fluid mechanics, which is um, essentially making use of methods like the finite element method to analyze fluid motion around a particular object or inside a, a closed system. This is pretty much what we will use in the actual design of anything that contains a fluid. But because we need to understand the concepts and the fundamental physics behind that to actually implement it properly, that's why we need to develop these fluid mechanics from, from a more classical perspective without having to resort to sophisticated numerical methods. So whenever possible, we're going to find analytical solutions or approximate solutions to these problems without having to rely on computer packages of this sort. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is what is a fluid? What is a fluid? Because that's essentially what we're going to be talking about. We need to understand the properties of fluids if we are to understand their motion. Well, a fluid is just a substance that, substance that can flow. 
and flow means that it will move without having any elastic effects in it so you can imagine that something like water is a fluid because it flows if, if you put water on top of this little ledge that has no uh, walls on the sides so the water is going to tend to flow in this direction or if you have something like a pipe and then you have water going this way or any other liquid or a gas you can imagine that that's what we call pipe flow so in general a fluid can be either a gas or a salt or a liquid so we have a liquid or a gas now why are these considered fluids well remember from basic chemistry that a liquid is a substance in which the molecules are not necessarily stacked together very closely as they do in solids so if we have a bunch of molecules this would form a solid if the forces of attraction between them are strong enough to keep them in place without moving but in a liquid they kind of just float around a little bit so the forces are not strong enough to hold them together in this stationary fashion but rather they will tend to move a little bit and that's what gives liquids their properties of um, viscosity gas in the other hand is a substance that has um, a lot more degrees of freedom so basically the molecules have very little resistance or attractive forces between them so they tend to float around and occupy uh, less space so basically the density of a gas is going to be lower than the density of a liquid or solid within the same amount of volume so that's the main difference between them and when it comes to fluid mechanics we usually refer to these two uh, types of fluids in different ways so first of all we call a liquid an incompressible fluid incompressible fluid and this is the main focus of this course because liquids are what we deal with the most when it comes to civil and mechanical applications gas is more often used in things like chemical industry and also in aerodynamics so if you have something like a, a jet turbine or rocket you will use gas dynamics but that's a, a little bit more complicated because gases are compressible so because the the particles or the molecules in a gas are floating around so freely and the forces of attraction are so so low and minimal the gases can actually be compressed and that complicates our analysis because that means that where we thought uh, a molecule or particle might be in space it might actually be in another in another point in in space so basically that complicates the analysis further so for the purposes of this course we're just going to focus on incompressible fluids which are just liquids and we also have some basic fluid properties so basic properties may include things like the density So we have density of a fluid, which is just the amount of mass that is contained within uh, a particular unit of volume. And it is usually represented by the Greek letter rho. So we have as mass over volume. And the reason we have this capital V with, with a little horizontal line crossing it in the middle is because in fluid me mechanics, we deal a lot with different... Um, velocities and different things that will use the letter V so it, it tends to be customary to use this kind of rotation to just differentiate and say this just refers to volume this couldn't be velocity or anything else this V with this line represents volume so this is just standard notation in, in a lot of uh, fluid mechanics textbooks and basically we know that the units are going to be kilograms per meter cubed <coughs> The next thing we're going to look at is specific weight. So specific weight. Which is basically represented by the letter gamma. And it represent, it's basically just the weight of the fluid over the volume. So basically it's just another way of representing density. But basically this one is going to be mg over volume and it is just the rho g and the units for these are newton per meter cubed 
So what does this represent? Well, if you remember, for a solid, we usually we usually deal with weight, which is just mass times gravity. Well, when it comes to fluids, the main property that we're interested in is the density. And basically, this is just an analogous to the weight of a solid, but we're just taking the density instead of the mass and multiplying it by the gravitational constant, which is usually 9.81 meters per second squared. So that's just the main difference between them. But in general, they're just analogous um, properties. And then we also have something called the specific gravity, not to be confused with the specific weight, of course. And it is essentially the ratio of a fluid's density to the density of a standard kind of uh, fluid. So usually we use the standard of water. So for example, if we want to find the specific gravity of some fluid, we will just weight it against the density of water, which is in under standard conditions. It is 1000 kilograms per meters cubed that's the density of water, at 25 degrees Celsius, or room temperature, and at a pressure of one atmosphere. So this is something that we'll talk about in a little bit. So the specific gravity of a fluid is just basically the ratio of those two. And it's just a comparison of how dense a particular fluid is compared to water, which is the standard. Now, a lot of the properties for fluids actually change when we change the temperature and the pressure. And in order to deal with that kind of thing, we created tables of standard values that basically tells the, the properties of a particular fluid, like the density, at very standard conditions. So standard conditions mean standard conditions usually refer to two things. We're dealing with room temperature, which is just 25 degrees Celsius, and we're dealing with a pressure of one atmosphere, which is just the atmospheric pr pressure, and one atmosphere is usually equivalent to 101 kilopascals. So that's basically what we mean by standard conditions. So if you look up a table of values, it would usually give you the properties of fluids at those um, standard conditions. There are properties of fluids at different temperatures and pressures, but it's usually more complicated because it's kind of trivial. You can go either way with these ones. And the last thing we're gonna look at is, of course, the ideal gas law. So what is an ideal gas? Well, an ideal gas is one in which the separation between the gas molecules is enough such that there's literally no attraction between them. So the separation in an ideal gas between the molecules is so, so large that we can pretty much ignore any attractive forces between them completely. So for an ideal gas, we have the following equation. We have the pressure of the gas um, equals to the density times the universal gas constant times the temperature in degrees Kelvin and the universal gas constant is 286.9 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. So that's the ideal gas law. Now let's do a little example just to show you just to show you how these things basically come together because I feel like we have been dealing with a lot of fundamental concepts so far, but we haven't really shown any examples. So let's have a look at the following simple example. Let's say we have a container, cylindrical container of this sort, and let's say it has a radius of 1.5 meters, <clears throat> and it has a length of 4 meters. And let's say we have air contained here, at a pressure of 60 kilopascals and at a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius. So we're asked to find what is the mass of that gas or of that air contained with that, within that cylindrical container. All right, so the first thing we need to do is, of course, convert all the units to the standard units that appear in our equation. So the equation we're going to be using is the ideal gas law. We have P equals rho RT. And we know that temperature uses Kelvin. So we need to convert this temperature to Kelvin. So let's have 
T Kelvin equals to T Celsius plus 273.15. And this is going to be equal to 333.15 degrees Kelvin. So the first thing you should do is always check that your units are consistent through gap and that they are actually the appropriate units to use with a particular formula. And now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to rearrange this equation to essentially find the density. So we're going to have P over RT because we know that the, the pressure is given as 60 kilopascals. So this is the same as 60 times 10 to 3 pascals over 286.9 that's from the universal gas constant and here we have 333.15 and this comes out to be 0 0.628 kilograms per meter cube so that's going to be the density of air within those conditions Okay, so now the final thing, we want to find what is the mass. Well, the mass is just going to be equal to the density times the volume. Can we find the volume? Well, we have the dimensions of the container, so yes, we can find the volume. The volume in this case is going to be the volume of the cylinder, which is going to be the area of the circle, which is pi r squared. So I'm just going to use little r here, pi r squared times the length. So this is the same as saying 0 0.628 times pi times 1.5 squared times 4. And this in the end gives us the following mass, 17.76 kilograms. So that's going to be the mass of that air contained within that container. So that's a considerable amount. And in the next video, we're going to continue talking about more properties of fluids, in particular viscosity and shear stress.